Okay, I know what you're thinking, but the title of this video actually has nothing to do directly with the recently concluded Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial. I'm done talking about that for now. So done. But it is sort of related, and it's also related to another previous video I made on the topic of gun violence, in which I mentioned that in 62 8.2% of mass shootings, the perpetrator either killed at least one partner or family member or had a history of domestic violence. It stands to reason that if we really refuse to do the obvious thing and make guns more difficult to access here in the United States, another way we might be able to reduce mass shootings would be to find and arrest perpetrators of domestic violence as quickly as possible. There are a number of problems with that approach, though. Uh, First, I'll cite the National Institute of Corrections Special Report, Practical Implications of Current Domestic Violence Research for Law Enforcement Prosecutors and Judges. According to the National Violence Against Women Survey, only 27% of women and 13.5% of men who were physically assaulted by an intimate partner reported their assault to law enforcement. Less than 20% of women victims reported intimate partner rapes to police. Once reported, police arrest rates vary depending on the jurisdiction and how each defines domestic violence. Arrests for domestic violence per 1,000 persons range from 3.2 in Omaha, Nebraska to 12.2 in Wichita, Kansas. I'll pause here to um, first point out, because those figures are a little bit confusing, the Department of Justice says about half of domestic violence reports result in an arrest. I'd also like to highlight another problem with the reporting and arrest of domestic violence perpetrators. 40% of police officers admitted to abusing their spouse in the previous six months in a survey undertaken in 1991. Uh, That figure has been supported by other surveys. A meta-analysis published in 2016 found that the rate of officer-perpetrated domestic violence ranged from 4.8% to 40%, with a pooled rate of 21.2%. So, yeah, th- those are the guys arresting other domestic violence perpetrators. Anyway, back to the NIC report. Prosecution rates similarly vary. A review of 26 domestic violence prosecution studies from across the country found prosecutions per arrest ranged from 4.6% in Milwaukee in 1992 to 94% reported in Hamilton, Ohio in 2005. The average rate was 63.8% and the median rate was 59.5%. So yeah, a minority of domestic violence victims report their assaults. About half of those are arrested and about half of those are prosecuted, leading to the conclusion that judges typically see only a small minority of domestic violence cases that actually occur. Once they're in the courtroom, most accused domestic violence perpetrators are convicted. So that's good, right? Well, not necessarily if we're talking about a conviction that leads to imprisonment. The United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world, handily beating out El Salvador, Turkmenistan, Palau, and Rwanda. USA! USA! Oh, hold on. It turns out that the number of people we put in prison doesn't necessarily mean less crime. According to the National Resource Council of the United States National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, On balance, panel data studies support the conclusion that the growth in incarceration rates reduce crime, but the magnitude of the crime reduction remains highly uncertain, and the evidence suggests it was unlikely to have been large. Throwing domestic violence perpetrators in prison might stop them from abusing partners for a little while, but eventually they leave prison, and research shows that about a quarter of them that we know of refer back to the stuff I just said about how few instances are reported or result in arrest and conviction. Um, About a quarter of them, though, maybe end up abusing a partner again within three years. That number could be as high as like 45% within five years. It may be even higher. So how do we make actual change in the form of stopping abusers from abusing again once they serve their sentence? For the past 40 years or so, the only real attempt to rehabilitate abusers has been what's known as the Duluth model, an intervention program more or less based on second wave feminist theory. 
Workers at domestic violence agencies in the late 1970s and early 1980s suspected that men abuse women not because of individual choices, but because of a society that marginalized women and entitles men to use violence uh, to maintain power and control over their partners. Instead of throwing these men in prison, we're better off re-educating them by challenging patriarchal beliefs and promoting accountability. You may already notice something a little bit wrong with that. Um, what about women who abuse men or violence that takes place within same-sex couples? Yeah, you know, like second wave feminism itself, the Duluth model was a bit of an underbaked cake. But at the time, it was the only cake we had. So uh, we used it. Um, and it did appear to help reduce the number of abusers who reoffended. So it was instituted around the country. Unfortunately, as more and more data has been collected over the decades, it seems like the Duluth model and other similar interventions for domestic violence perpetrators only makes a small dent in recidivism. A systematic review from 2021 found insufficient evidence to conclude that these programs are effective, despite modest but statistically non-significant benefit for the program group. The authors of that study urged that new programs and or entirely new approaches to this important social problem should be explored. Well, they asked, and Amy Zarling, clinical psychologist and associate professor of human development and family studies at Iowa State University, answered with a new study titled, A Randomized Clinical Trial of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy and the Duluth Model Classes for Men Court Mandated to a Domestic Violence Program, which is available in full at ResearchGate. As always, link is in the transcript, which you can find linked below. Zarlene wanted to put the Duluth model up against cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. I actually talked about another study incorporating CBT back in January when I took credit for inventing it. Uh, it's the idea that we can change our behaviors by reevaluating our thoughts that lead to the emotions that inspire our behavior. Change the thoughts, change the behavior. I also talked about mindfulness in that video. Yes, thoughts lead to behaviors, but we don't necessarily have to change those thoughts. We just have to recognize them, understand the context in which they're occurring, and then modify our behavior the way we want. If you didn't watch that video, the study in question compared these two techniques, and they found that both were equally good at fixing a bad mood, but they worked better if the person doing it was told that they were better at that technique that they were using rather than the other technique. It, it's kind of weird and fun. Go watch that video later after this one. Anyway, Zarling developed a new intervention for abusers based on mindfulness, which is known as acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT. She hoped to increase psychological flexibility in the abusers, writing that psychological flexibility is the ability to choose pro-social and value-based behavior, even if psychological barriers like anger, shame, maladaptive beliefs are present. A lack of psychological flexibility is linked to avoidance of emotional experiences and impulsivity and aggressive behavior in particular. Under the Duluth model, an abusive man who thinks, my partner shouldn't treat me this way, uh, he would be taught that this thinking comes from a patriarchal society and isn't necessarily right, and then be encouraged to think a more egalitarian thought. Under Zarlene's ACT-based program, he would instead be asked to accept that he thinks that way, but to understand that he doesn't need to act in accordance with that thought. He's instead asked to think about his values like love and family, and then he's asked to instead behave in accordance with those values. To test if this approach works, Zarlene pre-registered her study. And as you all know by now, this is my favorite type of study. Pre-registering means that a researcher can't collect loads and loads of data and then hunt through them looking for anything with a significant result. 
She then randomly assigned about 300 men, all of whom were on parole for domestic violence, to a once a week treatment over 24 weeks, with about half of them getting the Duluth model and the other half getting ACT. She then checked in one year later to see if any of them had been convicted of any crimes, including domestic violence. She also interviewed their victims to see if there was any evidence that the men's behavior had changed. That is, of course, only the victims who were still in contact with the men. The results were very interesting. Um, first of all, there was actually no difference between the two groups on domestic violence recidivism. Both groups, uh, about 13% of the men in either group went on to be charged again for domestic violence. I know, you, you weren't expecting that, were you? However, there were other very important differences. The ACT group had about half as many later convictions for any kind of crime at all, be it drug possession or robbery or something else, compared to the Duluth group. Also, the victims who remained in contact with the perpetrators reported significantly fewer aggressive, controlling, and stalking behaviors from the men who were in the ACT group. And more of those victims were able to report zero physical assaults or other dangerous behaviors in the year following treatment. That's really promising. Uh, the lack of a difference in terms of domestic violence recidivism may be due to a small sample size and an interrupted treatment schedule, both of which occurred due to complications from COVID in March of 2020. A larger study may find that there's a difference there. But even if there is no difference, the significant difference in victim reports and overall crime convictions offers a really compelling case to switch to ACT anyway. So does that mean that the feminists got it all wrong? Well, you know, yes and no. We do live in a patriarchal society and a lot of male violence directed towards male or female intimate partners or towards women in general or towards other men is a direct result of a society that turns a blind eye to or encourages or even rewards male aggression. But that doesn't mean that individual choice doesn't matter at all. As we can see when women abuse their male or female partners, and it also doesn't mean that the solution on an individual basis is telling men that they must first change the fucked up mindset they've lived with all their lives in order to change their behaviors. Maybe the solution is to tell individuals that their behaviors don't need to follow mindlessly from their thoughts and emotions, and to help them recognize their core values and the types of behaviors that can help them achieve what they really want out of life. The added benefit is that this type of treatment can apply to women as well as men, to gay people as well as to straight people, and to a myriad of antisocial behaviors as well as to domestic violence. And in the meanwhile, we can still work to fix a patriarchal society that raises us to have these malignant mindsets in the first place. It's a win-win. 